It's the Sound of Ideas from Ideas Stream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for joining us. The popularity of diabetes and weight loss drugs like Ozempic and Wagovi made by Novo Nordisk and Manjaro made by pharmaceutical company Eli Lilly is undeniable. Since this class of medications have come on the scene, clinical research has shown to be these medicines to be very effective and have been described as a game changer when it comes to fighting obesity. These GLP-1 drugs originally approved for type 2 diabetes work by suppressing the appetite. People who take these drugs are losing, on average, 10 to 20 percent of their body weight. Some lose much more. And for many, shedding this weight means warding off other health complications like heart disease and high blood pressure. But there can be side effects that come with these drugs when people are taking them and once they stop taking the drug, such as gastrointestinal issues and loss of muscle mass. And their popularity has meant shortages in which patients can't get access to the medications. For example, there has been a patient wait list for Ragovi since last summer. Additionally, the drugs are expensive. If not covered by insurance, this medication can run an individual $1,200 a month. And now companies behind the drugs are raising their prices. And what doctors will tell you is that these drugs are not meant to be a panacea or a standalone cure-all for weight loss. So let's have a real conversation about these medications. Who's getting them? Who's not? What are the real risks and benefits? And what does the public need to look for when considering taking them? For this conversation, I am joined by Dr. Rena Bose, who specializes in obesity medicine at the Endocrine and Metabolic Institute at Cleveland Clinic. Dr. Bose, welcome to you. Thank you, Jenny. I'm glad we are having this conversation today. As am I. I'm also joined in studio by Stephanie Metzger-Lawrence, a digital producer here at Ideastream. Your first time on the show. So glad to have you, Stephanie. Thank you. If you'd like to join the conversation or have a question, call our toll-free number 866-578-0903. We're phasing out our 216 number. So again, that's 866 866- Five seven eight zero nine zero three. You can email us at soi at ideastream dot org or tweet us. We're at Sound of Ideas. Stephanie, uh, I spoke to it in my introduction, but how would you characterize the rise in popularity of this class of weight loss and diabetes medications over, let's say, the past year or so? Yeah. So government data show that as much as forty percent of the U.S. population meets the medical definition of obesity. So that's a body mass index of 30 or higher. And it seems like the efficiency of weight loss drugs has also really developed. So, you know, 10 years ago, they were associated with maybe 5 10% total body weight loss. Now these current medications are anywhere from 15 20 um, even more uh, percent. So I think that combined with more societal awareness that obesity is a disease, um, it requires medical expertise and management, Um, And I think that's really pushed us to a place where we're hyper aware of the obesity problem in the U.S. And these drugs are really now being viewed as a potential, you know, life changer for some people. And Dr. Bose, tell me the types of patients you are seeing in your office at the Cleveland Clinic and what the patient demand has been for this class of medications. Yeah. Hi, Jenny. Um, Yes. um, So, you know, uh, the patients I'm seeing primarily come under the class one obesity, uh, many of them are class three obesity where BMI can be as high as 40 or higher. Mm. And then, you know, most of them will either be pre-diabetic or actually become diabetic by the time, you know, they've struggled with so much of weight, blood pressure, cholesterol, heart issues. So kind of a lot of chronic health issues um, that goes along with obesity. So it, it's really, really important that we, you know, make the patients aware that, you know, obesity is not a choice. Many of them come in feeling like, you know, it, it's their fault that they have gained so much weight. And I always validate that, you know, it's not their fault. It is uh, a disease. And now we actually have fantastic medications out there to help them with their disease in conjunction with lifestyle changes like diet, exercise, managing their stress and sleep. So I know um, that, you know, you threw out the word fantastic when describing these class of medications. What makes them, in your perspective, so effective? So the new class of drugs, as everybody's 
probably fam familiar with um, currently are the GLP-1, the glucagon-like peptide uh, medications. These drugs primarily came out to help our patients with type 2 diabetes. You know, they do help improve insulin secretion, sensitivity, help with controlling hunger. So patients were noticing weight loss in addition to better control of their sugars. So then the company decided, okay, let's also market these drugs for obesity. And that was a big game changer for many of our patients. You know, I have patients now who are no longer diabetic. You know, they don't have high blood pressure because they've lost a significant amount of weight. So their chronic health issues are improving. You know, Dr. Bose, I had mentioned uh, on average 10 to 20 percent weight loss uh, for, for uh, the average of individuals. But can that be higher? Of course, and like you said, you know, you have a patient of mine coming on shortly. But yeah, I have patients who have lost 30%, 40% of their weight loss. Um, again, medication guided plus guided with my team at our Cleveland Clinic Metabolic Institute. So we have our dietitians guiding patients on protein consumption, healthy eating, um, uh, exercise physiologists guiding them on movement and muscle, moving their muscle mass, you know, gaining more lean mass. I help manage uh, sleep disorders as well, along with my sleep colleagues, and then managing their stress. Um, so all of this allows them to have meaningful weight loss. And the goal is this prevention of weight regain. Um, so yeah, so these medications have made it very effective for patients to achieve their goals. Stephanie, these aren't cheap drugs to begin with. And according to your recent reporting, pharmaceutical companies as of the new year have raised prices slightly. So what's the rationale for that? That's correct. So pharmaceutical brands hiked the price of prescription weight loss drugs by about a medium of 4.5% uh, to start 2024. And that's according to a Wall Street Journal analysis. So Novo Nordisk, their Ozempic, rose about 3.5%, so that's about $970 for a month's supply, while Eli Lilly's Manjaro rose to about 4.5%, and so that puts it at just under $1,100 for a month's supply. Now, Novo Nordisk said uh, their changes in its prices, they consider market conditions like inflation, while Eli Lilly said it sets its prices based on value, efficacy, and safety. Is there a rationale um, that that sounds reasonable to you, Dr. Bose, about hearing prices going up when, um, you know, they're already very expensive and can be cost prohibitive for certain populations, especially in Ohio? You know, again, that's a excellent question, um, Jenny. So, you know, this is something me and my patient will struggle with on a day to day basis is is there access to the drug? Is there coverage and is it affordable? Um, so many of my patients struggle with affordability. Uh, as you mentioned earlier, some of the drugs like Bigovi are still not in the market for the starting dosages. So patients are still waiting since, uh, I would say, maybe June of last year to start the drug. But I think the cost of these drugs is uh, it's a little, uh, is high. I mean, I, I wish <laughs> I could, you know, I wish our companies could could actually make the prices more um, competitive. And I'm hoping with more drugs entering the market, the prices might become competitive and hopefully the insurance carriers will have better coverage for these drugs. And Dr. Bose, I think it, it, it's you know duly important when talking about this uh, medication to talk about what the, the risks are of these medicines and if there are negative side effects that come with taking these medications. So yes, uh, this is the discussion I have every day in my office with the patient. Again, not every patient qualifies for these drugs. There are some patients who are um, not the right candidate for the medication for these GLP ones. So um, I always talk to patients once they do it, finally start on these drugs that you know you have to meet our dietitians. Slowly focusing on eating healthier, uh, definitely maintaining a healthy protein intake. Because like you mentioned earlier, with these drugs, um, there is a chance of loss of uh, lean muscle mass, which can be problematic for patients. We also slowly encourage them to start some movement, some exercises, so they feel more empowered with their weight loss. Stephanie, clinical research shows these drugs have proven effective 
Uh, Dr. Bose says, you know, it's been a game changer within her office and with her population of patients. Yet I do think there is kind of this cynicism towards the drugs. And uh, when out there in the ether, there's been criticisms of the use of this drug for weight loss. I think especially when, you know, kind of your average person is looking on the TV or the movie screen, they're seeing you know, Hollywood stars that seem to be losing weight rapidly and they go, oh, they must be on Ozempic. What's your perspective as a journalist about that kind of cynicism uh, and maybe the Hollywood effect? Yeah, I think seeing celebrities suddenly drop a significant, noticeable amount of weight in a very short time, it's become fairly common. You know, anytime you open up, you know, an Instagram feed, you see that. So like anything influenced by celebrities, regular people want the same thing. Um, obviously, it's you know not quite as attainable. Um, so I think that's led to actually a lot of misconception and confusion on weight loss drugs, um, especially some uh, semaglutides. They're meant to treat diabetes and real obesity, not cosmetic weight loss. Um, you know, it's not really meant to drop just a few pounds. And then you have people who might look at weight loss medications as sort of a catch-all, um, or an easy way out when there's still a a full weight management plan that needs to be had for these patients, Um, you know, diet, movement, and other potential psychological or even mood habits that need to be addressed. Dr. Bose, do you think there is a problem with those who may not need the drug uh, getting quicker in line to get them and then precluding someone who, let's say, has diabetes and can't get access to the drug? Yes, of course, Um, you know, and like you mentioned, you know, when patients uh, are taking this for cosmetic weight loss, like you highlighted, it's not ideal for them to lose a rapid amount of weight in a short amount of time. It's actually a disadvantage. They will tend to lose muscle mass and the weight regain is much quicker. Um, So, yeah, so so I definitely encourage patients that, you know, they have to make uh, uh, an effort to really try to work on their lifestyle, really try to work on the diet. Um, And again, at the clinic, we do have a team of people helping our patients kind of, you know, along their weight loss journey. Again, we'd love to hear from you. The toll-free number, 866-578-0903, or shoot us an email, soi at ideastream.org. Are you interested in these medications or have a personal story about taking one of these drugs? Please call in or drop us an email. I would like to introduce Bridget Whitford of Bay Village into the conversation. She's on the line. She and her husband are patients of Dr. Bose. They're both in their mid-50s, and collectively, the two of them have lost nearly 200 pounds. Bridget, welcome to the show. Good morning. Thanks so much for having me. So tell me about how you first went into the uh, office at the Cleveland Clinic and were prescribed Manjaro. Yeah, it's been such a positive experience, so I appreciate the opportunity to share. Um, my husband and I both ended up um, in Dr. Bose's office, um, kind of coincidentally because we were interested in the program for my son, and then we realized that this could be something that could really work for us. And um, it has it has changed it's changed our lives in such positive ways. Um, as you mentioned, we've lost almost 200 pounds collectively, but we've also gained a lot. We are so much more active. We both exercise regularly now. We both are, the way we eat in our household is very different. Food is not the focus of every entertainment thing that we do. And um, we really um, have embraced the the medication and the lifestyle change that really has to come with it in order for it to be effective. Now, I know that you lost, because we've spoken previously, you've lost about 80 pounds, and you were saying that, uh, uh, you know, previously you were getting winded, um, going up one flight of stairs, you were snoring when you slept, um, and it really, you described it as a new pension on life. I would absolutely describe it that way, and sometimes you don't even realize how bad it had gotten until you start to feel better, and I think one of the biggest things that I've noticed is I've yo-yoed in my weight throughout the years. I've done things like Weight Watchers, which is really a wonderful, well-balanced meal eating. And however, there was always this food noise in my head. So I, it was like a constant battle. I'm not going to eat that. I'm not going to eat that. I'm, I'm doing my Weight Watchers. I'm counting my points. I'm going to do that. Like, and it was, all consuming. Even when I was losing weight, all I was doing was thinking about food, whether I was eating it or not eating it, I was thinking about it. And now on these medications, that food noise has really quieted. And I'm able to just eat 
and eat like a reasonable amount. My portions have gone way down and I'm able to just not eat as much. And since I'm putting, since I'm paying a lot of money, number one, and taking a medication, and I don't tend to like to take medications. I'm not somebody that quickly turns to medication. I'm like, if I'm going to be putting this in my body, I'm going to be doing the work that's involved also. And so I'm going to try to make those healthier um, choices. Is, do I always? Not always. Do I need more protein? Yes, Dr. Bose will tell you I absolutely do. Um, but I'm trying to make better choices. And the, since the food noise is much quieter in my head, it's much easier to make those choices. We are currently talking about the class of medicines that were originally prescribed for diabetes but now have been shown to be very effective in weight loss. We have on the phone Dr. Rena Bose of the Cleveland Clinic, our digital producer Stephanie Metzger-Lawrence, who's been doing reporting on these drugs, and currently on the line Bridget Whitford of Bay Village, who's lost about 80 pounds since going on Manjaro. Let me ask you this, Bridget. Have you had people critical of your weight loss or telling you, oh, this is a cheat and, you know, you're just going to gain it back? What have, has been some of the feedback of you um, and, you know, kind of a, a lot of weight loss comparatively? Yeah, it's it's very interesting. I've had kind of some people that are super supportive and some people, the biggest thing I hear people say is, well, you can't stay on that forever. I mean, what are you going to do after, you know, after that? after you're done taking it. And, um, you know, I, my answer to that is that we'll see right now I'm titrated down to a very low dose and that seems to be working for me, but I'll continue to work with Dr. Bose about what the right, you know, is this something that I'm going to take more long-term potentially? But in the meantime, I've taken um, advantage of the wraparound services that Cleveland Clinic has meeting with the dietitian, meeting with the exercise psychologist, um, the the exercise physiologist and the and the nutrition psychologist and kind of trying to make better choices so and and adopting that into my lifestyle so that even without the support of the medication whatever that might look like long term that I would be better able to make those decisions um, but I also I, I don't know that I think having to come off of it people would say well you can't stay on it for life. I, I don't know. I'm going to turn to Dr. Bose and whether or not that is something that long term, I may be on a maintenance dose long term. And that that doesn't bother me. I think there are other people that take maintenance dose medications for lots of chronic conditions. And um, so I feel like the other options where I was winded walking up the steps, I was basically a walking heart attack risk and stroke risk. Those, those that might be riskier than a maintenance dose long term. Bridget, uh, don't go anywhere because I do have one more question because I know you have had some insurance issues with this medication. But Dr. Bose, I'm curious about that. I mean, Bridget it seems to, she's a believer. I mean, this has changed her life. She's working out. She feels better about herself, has energy, and is warded of some serious health complications. What about a permanent maintenance dose or whether Bridget has a, the prospect of ever getting off these medicines in order to keep those 80 pounds off? So yes, yeah, so thank you, Bridget, for sharing your story with the audience. Um, I, I feel like with Bridget and her husband, they have totally embraced the lifestyle changes, which as she has highlighted, has been crucial in keeping her weight down. So to answer the question, you know, do patients need this lifelong? Um, the data shows possibly yes, most probably most of them will need it lifelong, but maybe a very, very low dose, just enough to keep the disease at bay. Just like, for example, uh, someone with depression, anxiety, you know, they can suffer from this for the rest of their life. So just because the depression is controlled, we don't take patients off those meds. We have to put them on a maintenance dose so they can function. So similarly with obesity, so that bias for obesity treatment has to go away. We have to spread the awareness. So with, with drugs like uh, Zepbound and Vigovi and some of these other options, uh, patients can maintain uh, on the lowest dose possible. Um, and, you know, really have to remember to embrace lifestyle changes uh, at the same time. And there are a few of my patients who've been able to get off these drugs, but we are monitoring them very closely. Um, so, yes, yeah, so the answer is, you know, um, most probably these drugs are needed lifelong to maintain their weight loss. But there's always hope uh, that some of us can get off of it. 
I think it's very interesting to bring up the idea of, you know, depression and medications to treat and then, you know, the mental aspect of what Bridget is talking about and and this alleviating the food noise that persistently and consistently lived in her brain prior to um, and equating those two is very interesting. Uh Bridget, I want to ask you one more question. The reality is you were on Manjaro, Manjaro excuse me, for about a year, but then insurance said no. So tell me a little bit about this latest chapter and the realities of what you'd ha- you've had to do to stay on some type of drug of this nature. Yeah, it's, it's been really disappointing um, in terms of, of um, this journey. We had a really wonderful gig on, with Manjaro where it, there was a $25 coupon, monthly coupon. And so my husband and I were able to access Manjaro for a year um, at um, $25 a month. And then that coupon went away and our insurance doesn't cover it. And then we were looking at eleven, twelve hundred dollars $1,200 a month for each of us. And that was not in our budget to do that. So we've had to source uh, not Manjaro, but the... Uh, compounding pharmacy that uses the same active ingredient as Manjaro mm, um, through an online, they have like online doctors. And I know the lots of people access their medications this way. We continue to seek our care through Dr. Bose at the Cleveland Clinic and then just source our medication through these compounding pharmacies. It brings the cost down for us to about $400 per month for each of us, um, which is, you know, less than half of the um, name brand. But I would feel much more comfortable if we could actually get the name brand and the actual, you know, more regulated um, medication. But unfortunately, financially, it's just not a possibility for us right now. Uh, I'm going to have to ask you to address that, Dr. Bose. First, I want to thank you, Bridget, for participating in this conversation and sharing your story again with our audience, Bridget Whitford of Bay Village. Thank you so much. Thank you. So, Dr. Bose, you know, Bridget says she'd rather be on the name brand medication. It's having to do kind of this off brand. It's got the same working chemicals. But uh, is there work on the horizon to get these medications at a cost and readily available for all populations? So, you know, again, this is a question with lots of different answers. Sure. Um, what Bridget is what Bridget is trying to do is, you know, trying to maintain her weight um, and, and, and the weight loss that she has attained. Um, with many of these uh, compounding pharmacies, unfortunately, they are not FDA regulated. So mm. at the clinic, we are not endorsing the use of compounding pharmacies. Some of the salts they use to compound the medication is not reliable at all. So patients can have either rapid weight loss or no effect at all. So a lot of side effects um, uh, are things that we have to look for. So, you know, patients choose to to make that decision whether they want to go with the compounding pharmacy but most of them do not want to do that they would rather have the drug made by the drug company that is FDA approved so I'm hoping um, down the road um, you know there is much better access and definitely affordability to these drugs so our patients can take full advantage of these meds. All right, let's take a couple of listener calls and emails. Donna has been waiting patiently on the line calling in from Dayton this morning. Donna good morning go ahead. Good morning. I'm Donna Johnson from Dayton, Ohio, and I'm here to talk about that I'm on Exemphic, and I had a high A1C that was 14, and I have cataracts. And when I went to my eye doctor, she was telling me that what is my A1C now since I've been on Exemphic, and it went down to a 10. And, of course, my doctor here in Ohio said that was still too high. So she said I have to get down to a seven to have my cataracts taken out. And I'm so glad that I'm on Exempic because now the possibility is there for me because I lived with a high sugar for 15 years before the old Zippy came out for the diabetic two people. And now that I'm on it, I see a possibility that I could have my cataracts taken out. Okay, I appreciate that call, Donna. And she introduces an interesting point, Dr. Bose, about the gamut of other physiological conditions that having all of that extra weight can bring. So what have you found and what has the research found when it comes to warding off really serious conditions with these medications? So yes, um, Donna, thank you for calling in. And I'm so glad to hear that your diabetes is getting better controlled. Um, so yes, um, I think specifically regarding Donna, if her A1C is slowly improving, but remember we don't want rapid improvement in sugar because sometimes that can also affect the eyes uh, and diabetic retinopathy. So slow improvement is better. 
Uh, but yeah, she will probably decrease her risk of developing diabetic retinopathy, meaning diabetes in the uh, vessels in the eye. I have patients who see me now because they have to be down maybe 10% of the weight before their orthopedic surgeons give them a total knee replacement or a total hip replacement. So I think with these new medications, it has become um, uh, really a great way for patients to get to a, a better weight so they can deal with other chronic health issues. We have an email from Carrie that says, I'm currently taking a combination of bupropion and naltrexone, I hope I'm saying those right, which is marketed as a single medication called Contrave. What is the difference between a drug like Ozempic and Contrave? Dr. Bose? So again, uh, Kerry, thank you for your email. So yes, so bupropion and naltrexone is, uh, is FDA approved in the form of Contrave to help patients with <coughs> weight loss as well. This medication works really well for patients who struggle with something called emotional eating, you know, eating when you're stressed, eating when you're bored. So many of us uh, unfortunately struggle with those kind of urges. So this medication can make a big difference for the emotional eating. Again, the GLP ones um, can help can help with that as well, but primarily it's good for patients who ha also have, you know, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, or of course type 2 diabetes. Stephanie, you know, Bridget talked about the fact that she's on uh, a medication from a compounding pharmacy. So what has your reporting told you about um, other medications that aren't essentially the big brand name, Ozempic, Manjaro, Wegovi, that are coming onto the market and what the public needs to watch out for when, you know, maybe trying to shop around just based on uh, how much they can afford? Yeah, so there's this emergence of you know some of these online pharmacy brands um some that come to mind are hers and found i think found does offer some aglutides, um but many of these do offer some of these other weight management aids like naltrexone um, which um, dr bez mentioned is meant to treat addiction-like behaviors um, so it seems like, you know, there are more of these options that are coming to the market. But as Dr. Bose mentioned, you really do need a plan um, and someone to really closely yeah. monitor the decisions that you're making when it comes to these medications. An email from Susan asks, are there any implications for use with those with addiction disorders? Suppressing the urge seems really powerful. Dr. Bose? Yes, Susan, again, excellent point here. Um, looks like the, these GLP ones are being considered as well for patients struggling with addiction um, uh, issues, you know, like alcohol and so on. Um, but as of now, we are not using it. It's not yet indicated for that, but off label, like when I see patients in the office and some of them do struggle with, you know, use of alcohol and so on, and they have noted that they are not able to drink as much anymore and they don't have the urge to drink as much. So I think this uh, class of drugs really has like a, um, you know, fantastic um, reach as far as, you know, not just food addiction, but looks like other addictions as well. Uh, we had an email uh, asking how Dr. Um, excuse me, Bridget Whitford and her husband could afford the drugs when insurance wasn't covering. Um, to clarify, uh, Bridget and her husband are paying $400 each for the medication from the compounding for pharmacy. So for them, it's a total of $800 a month, which is expensive, but much cheaper than the brand name drugs. Uh, we're going to close out our conversation soon, but we did have another question, uh, Dr. Bose, about whether someone who's looking to lose a little bit of weight um, and, and definitely kind of asking the question about cosmetic weight loss that maybe isn't life impacting. What are your thoughts on that kind of weight loss and introducing this kind of medicine? Sure. Um, so I see patients uh, all the time who are just in the overweight category, not necessarily obese, who just don't want to get to the obese category. So these medications are not something I prescribe to every patient. You know, again, every patient has to have a tailored approach to their care. So someone who has uh, issues with just a little bit of weight gain, there's a lot of different uh, options. Firstly, why are they gaining weight? So that comes from the history. 
um, again introduction uh, to you know diet you know maybe they're not eating on time you know maybe they're not eating the right kind of food so guidance on diet with the help of our dietitians exercise maybe they've got a joint injury and that has limited their mobility so finding ways where they can still move around that limitation with the help of our exercise physiologists all of that can really help them uh, get to a better weight and Stephanie, I'll, I'll, I'll end with you, you know, as you've done a kind of a series of reports on this medication, what do you be looking out for um, as this kind of story progresses? Yeah, I think um, the main thing is going to be competitive uh, pricing. You know, it sounds like there are more options on the horizon. You know, is that bound is another drug that we're hearing more of since it dropped last year. Um, and last week, the CEO of AstraZeneca said that, you know, their focus is going to be on a weight loss drug that yields more fat loss and less loss in muscle mass. And he also mentioned cheaper prices, which of course will be, is yet to be seen. Um, so I think hopefully with more options, more research, more production, you know, hopefully that's gonna lead to better prices for these. All right, Stephanie Metzger-Lawrence, our digital producer here at IdeaStream, and Dr. Rena Bose with the Cleveland Clinic. Thank you so much for taking the time and joining me this morning. Thank you, Thank you for having me. Time now for a quick break, but after, we'll learn about a shop in Worcester that features local goods and helps local chefs feed the community. This is The Sound of Ideas. I'm Jenny Hamill. We'll be right back. You're with The Sound of Ideas from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for staying with us this hour. Wayne County has a rich agricultural history and a strong agricultural economy, which includes more than 1,700 farms. It makes sense then that those who live in and around Wayne County should be able to purchase all that produce that's grown right in their own backyards. Now that is where the shop Local Roots comes in. Local Roots opened about a decade ago in downtown Worcester with the mission of supporting local farms and producers in the region. But Local Roots didn't just stop at stocking shelves with seasonal harvests. It also acts as a bit of an entrepreneurial incubator where chefs can rent kitchen space and maybe even launch a new food venture. With me now to discuss the impact and growing mission of Local Roots is their executive director, Adam Schwederman. Adam, thanks for being with us today. Hi, Jenny. Thanks Good. so much for having me. Yeah, great to have you. If you'd like to join the conversation or have a question for Adam, call 866-578-0903. You can email us at soi at ideastream.org, or you can tweet us. We are at Sound of Ideas. Adam, before we jump into what Local Roots does, can you talk a little bit more about the farming landscape of Worcester and Wayne County? How does all that agricultural activity affect the local economy? Yeah, it's a core component of the identity of all the people that live there. I, I always tell people that aren't from the area, when you look at the the geographic region, you have uh, Appalachian Mountains kind of, you know, running off there. We're the last county, you know, Holmes County to the south of us is still, you know, federally designated as Appalachian, mm. um, which is just like rolling foothills at the end of it. And then Wayne County just north of that, you know, just south of Medina and, and kind of leading into Cleveland proper um, is really the end of that. And so you get these rolling hills and small farms that are kind of broken up by all the creeks and the rivers. Um, so it's just, it makes it a perfect space to keep these kind of small farms. I grew up on the western side of the state, which is also very beautiful as well. But if you imagine, you know, Indiana, kind of Illinois Corn Belt, it's a little bit more of that over there. And over here, because this, the farms are smaller and they're a little, little bit hillier, it doesn't aid itself to that as much. And so you get people that can still grow produce or um, meats or, you know, whatever on small plots of land. And then we have a vibrant, rich downtown that's been rejuvenated over the last 30 years. So you get this kind of fun mix of having a downtown that has coffee shops and yoga shops and Worcester and all sorts of um, things that are interesting to people that want a more metropolitan lifestyle, but it's just surrounded by these beautiful, small, family-kept farms. Okay, so what are some of the best examples of delicious local produce that people can find in that region? What's being grown there? Yeah, well, I think it's a, it's a full bouquet, which is what makes it so interesting. You know, you have 
um, fruits that are still grown in that area. There's nothing better than a fresh picked strawberry right off the vine in the summer. Um, harder to find probably in downtown Cleveland than it is in Worcester. <laughs> right. um, but uh, that goes, you know, we're the largest uh, dairy producer in the state. So um, still a lot of that type of activity in the area and um, people growing things in greenhouses and hoop houses now, which is um, keeping the extended season a little bit longer. So even today in the you know middle of February, you can still go there and get lettuces that are um, being grown fresh and picked daily. And more broadly, I mean, when people are looking to buy fresh produce, maybe from Ohio um, generally, uh, what should they be looking for when it comes to uh, the right kind of produce, and maybe it's seasonal too. Yeah, I mean, I think that's very much up to the individual and what they have available to them, of course. You know, I always tell people if they can eat healthy and local, they should. If they can't, um, you know, do the best that you, you can. Every area in Ohio is going to be different, has a different kind of supply. Um, but what we try to champion, the thing that's really important to us to be able to offer to our community is that whole local aspect. So when you walk into the the you know storefront at local roots there's a really good chance you're going to see a farmer stocking the shelf wow and so you can walk up and meet that person and ask them how the how the products are grown you know what uh what the inputs are what the outputs are then most of them are you know very smart individuals very passionate about what they do so they can talk to you about growing practices and you know, nutrient density and things like that that you just can't get at a big American, you know, standard box grocery store. There's something so romantic about just the imagery even of just a farmer and something freshly grown and of the earth. Yeah, it's very ideological and it's easy to, you know, stand up and talk about it because it's so special. Okay, well then let's talk about local roots. We are, you know, I would say the public's very familiar with farmers markets and stands, but the idea that there's a a big store that is fully stocked with kind of this homegrown, locally grown source products. Uh, How did the concept first arise and how did it develop into what it is today? Yeah. And I I just add, I'm just a representative of the organization. I I started there uh, about 10 years ago, but it was founded before I got there. Um, and I think for listeners, maybe you don't make your way all the way down to Worcester to go shop and see it. Um, but you could imagine, you know, because you, you know, everybody needs to eat and a lot of people care more and more these days about knowing where their food comes from and how it was grown and, um, supporting local, like you said, has become a lot more popular. So I would imagine that, you know, I hope listeners are interested in the whole business model and how it came to be. Um, the concept really started back in 2009, and it was a group of interested community members that were putting the pieces of the puzzle together and saying, you know, we had a downtown farmer's market, which is an amazing asset for a lot of communities across the state and the country and the world. It's nice to be able to access those things, but a lot of them are only one day a week. And if you look at the business model from the farmer's standpoint, you know, only selling your, uh, your wares one day a week uh, isn't necessarily a full full blown business model. Sure. Um, what if produce goes ripe on Monday? What happens? What if they go to the farmers market to sell all their stuff on Saturday and it rains all day? Mm-hmm. You know those types of things happen. Um, also, what if as a customer you can't make it to the farmers market on Saturday because you work? Where are you supposed to get your local food? So I always tell people not a totally revolutionary concept the seven day a week market, but like you hinted at having all of that in the same house, in the same building, and being able to operate seven days a week is really special, not just for the producers, but for the customers too. And so a group of interested community members got together. They started talking about the idea. They found that it could be viable in our area, and they held a public interest meeting at the library. Very, very grassroots, like, you know, no startup costs, no investment, and, uh, you know, the fable goes over 150 people showed up and they started selling shares of the cooperative. Um, so we're a co-op. And so it's basically publicly owned or uh, owned by the members, which is a, is a pretty cool concept. And it started with an old abandoned building underutilized right in our downtown and farmers actually standing behind 
card tables with linen cloths on it and selling their stuff like an indoor farmer's market. And over the last 15 years, that's grown, you know, very organically, kind of slow growth to getting a couple of coolers, you know, volunteers in there, painting the walls, you know, doing carpentry work to build the counters, make a little bit of money, get a computer system, you know, make a little bit more money, add another cooler. And so at that point, you start adding, going just away from produce and adding meat and eggs and dairy and um, other refrigerated items, freezers. And uh, from that, it spanned from, you know, a kind of modest little concept to something that it is today, which, you know, in terms of most major food businesses, still very, very modest. <laughs> I don't want to make it sound like a behemoth. Um, we're still a very small, small family, um, you know, community run kind of operation. But um, now seven days a week and we sell on annual averages, uh, about 300 producers will sell with us in a given year, which is kind of special. Wow. And are they all from the region, these 300 producers? Yeah. Yep. And a lot of them are, you know, most of them, the vast majority don't have any employees. It's just a person with a passion or a hobby. You know, if you uh, think you can um, make a go at something, you know, that you mentioned the commercial kitchen aspect, which I hope we get into because it's a really special yeah, component definitely. of what we do. Um, but you can come in with just an idea and kind of get started and see if it goes. And so, um, Adam, I am, I'm curious, it, it does seem like a special model. Is this something that exists in other parts of the country? Is it replicated or a model that you, that even kind of people involved with the origin story of local roots might have looked elsewhere, um, to see, Hey, maybe it can work here. Yeah. Uh, both, I guess would be the way to say that. I've never found anything in, in my research or in my work that is exactly like what we do. Um, and there's uh, a group of people that have kind of spun off of what we were doing and started similar things. And I think the model's gaining traction. We have a, a conference coming up actually in March. It's going to be hosted in Ann Arbor. Oh, wow. And they're bringing a bunch of people together that are doing similar things. So there's a group in Michigan that has a very similar um, approach to us, a couple of uh, teams down in West Virginia that are doing very similar work, one over in Indiana, and we're pulling all those people together and talking about how to strengthen this model and see if we can make it more impactful for communities, you know, here locally in Ohio, but also regionally and maybe even nationally. I'm curious, do you think that there is a growing public understanding about being more mindful about where our food is coming from. There's been lots of conversations about meat and how it's produced and, and you know, its impacts on uh, global warming. I, I'm wondering if you think if the public seems to be aware of the fact that maybe we should really know where our food comes from. Yeah, yeah, unequivocally, absolutely. And I think that is it's different for every single individual you know a lot of people are passionate about different things and they come to us for different reasons so some people are you know they're very interested in having you know food with very little preservatives or very little chemicals and like i was saying you can come to us and actually get to know your farmer that direct farmer to consumer relationship is really what we advertise i can't tell you you know traceability of every single ingredient and where it comes from but the producer can. Mm -hmm. And you can't get that at a big box store. So we have a lot of people come to us for that. We also have people coming to us because they're really concerned about, you know, the carbon footprint of food. Why are we shipping blueberries up from South America, sure. which I, I, you know, not to knock that, I think we need blueberries year round too. So both models can kind of exist. But when you look at the carbon footprint of that compared to somebody growing it five miles away sure. and, you know, picking it by hand, and delivering it and you know it's a day old or less than a day old maybe it was picked that day the nutrient density of that and how fresh it is and the flavor is going to be better too a lot of those things just speak for themselves so people are really excited about it when they have it um, but it's hard to access you know so that's not um, you know I think if it was easy it'd be everywhere there's a reason that right it's hard to access um, so yeah I'm talking to Adam Schwederman, executive director of Local Roots in Worcester. Let's talk about this cafe kitchen and how it lends itself to being a helper of food entrepreneurs in the region. Yeah. Yeah. So we have uh, two different kitchens that we operate within Local Roots. One we call our cafe kitchen, and that's really for ready-to-eat foods. You know, so if somebody 
wants to come and get lunch um, or something from a takeout cooler, they can come to us and they can just grab a quick bite to eat. Uh, we do a rotating chef schedule. So like you mentioned, it's kind of a little bit of a small business incubator in that light too. So every day of the week is a different chef. It gives chefs the opportunity to come in. Maybe they've been a career long um, culinary uh, you know, chef and they've worked uh, th- different places throughout the industry. They decide to go out on their own. Well, the hurdle to being able to go out on your own, if you wanted to start your own restaurant or build your own commercial kitchen because you were trying to produce something that you could put a label on and sell it, you know, different uh, stores, it, it's massive. You know, estimated cost per square foot on commercial kitchens for new builds can be 250 to $300 a square foot right now. So you're talking about um, for a, a small owner to be able to go in and do that you know, maybe they don't have a full-fledged business model sure. yet. They haven't been, you know, gone to the bank and said, hey, I'm willing to put down a million dollars. I want to leverage my house so that I can sure. kind of do this thing. We offer that kind of shared use space. So chefs can come in, rent the space, and be able to make make lunch for a day, kind of like a ghost kitchen kind of concept that maybe listeners have heard of before. And then the other side of that is our commercial kitchen uh, aspect. So that's regulated by the Department of Agriculture and businesses come in, you know, I'll give you a great example is we have a local hot sauce uh, company that j- makes this fantastic hot sauce and they... What's it re- called? Old Dirty Sheets. Okay. Yep. And they... <laughs> Sheets is the guy's last name okay, that cool. runs it. So <laughs> it's a funky, funky spin. Um, but they were able to come in and, you know, not have to put all that investment up front, use our commercial kitchen, uh, be able to put a label on their product and and sell it. And so that shared use kind of concept, it cuts the cost down for them because not everybody needs their own kitchen the whole time. You know, that's a massive investment for the producer. But to be able to just come in and rent it for, you know, $10 an hour or $15 an hour or whatever and have a successful business run out of it is a huge, huge push. Plus then, you know, pair that with the market and all of a sudden you have producers working with local farmers to get that food into their packaged goods. So this hot sauce company is a great example. They partner with a a local organic uh, pepper farmer, and they actually work with them on getting the seeds picked out, planting those seeds, getting the peppers, and then he can preserve them and make them in his hot sauce year round. So we've only got a couple of minutes left. Uh, I want to ask you about Food Sphere, which is the nonprofit aspect of Local Roots. So tell me how it focuses on the entrepreneurial needs, I guess, of the region. Yeah, what what we found is that as we were operating Local Roots throughout that 10-year period that I was telling you about before, we had all this growth of these businesses that are coming into the store and people that are um, like I said, mom and pops, you know, individual operators, maybe their their daughter is home on college break and they're helping them out. But in order to be able to run a business, um, you know, with just one or two people, you have to be an expert on a lot of different things. Sure. And that puts a massive amount of pressure if they want to be able to survive in this, you know, tough business economy. Food businesses are uh, notoriously competitive and small margin. And what we found is that Maybe a farmer, as an example, is a really great farmer and they make an amazing product, but they're not great at graphic design, for sure. example. Or you might have a chef that makes a terrific product, um, but isn't an expert in accounting. And so all of these people were kind of coming together and helping each other out and then um, trying to grow their businesses. And what we realized was that was systemic enough and kind of predictable enough that it was like, why don't we start a separate organization It's a registered 501c3, so it's eligible for donations and grants and so forth uh, to be able to programmatically support some of these producers in ways that we weren't already doing. Okay, Adam Schwederman with Local Roots. You're the executive director. I got to say in our conversation, you've both increased my appetite and make me want to drive to downtown Worcester to check it out and to go to Local Roots and get some produce. So thank you. I'm sure that has had the same impact on our audience. Adam, I appreciate you joining us for this conversation and uh, maybe we'll see you in Worcester. Thank you. Okay. Now, that is it for our show. To get the last word on today's topic, send an email to soi at ideastream.org. We're on Twitter, now X, at Sound of Ideas. And you can follow me at Jenny Hamill underscore. 
Tuesday on the show, we had a really good conversation about how many shelters, animal shelters, are overflowing with pets. And we had a lot of feedback we didn't get to. Ray wrote us saying, thanks for hosting a show about dog rescue. My partner Marty and I are the recipients of two of the Wheaton Terriers that your guest mentioned from Holmes County. He mentioned that they were likely kennel stock that got out and were not claimed, and they're not the best socialized. They are less than a year old, and we are are 63 years old and still working and now they are caring for these dogs one is living with ray one is living with marty but they will see each other all the time and they wanted to thank mary urich of the national wheaton rescue organization for driving a total of three hours to get those dogs from holmes county to their homes so thanks for writing in ray now tomorrow on the sound of ideas it's the friday reporters roundtable with mike mcintyre this week he's joined by glenn forbes and taylor wisner here at the idea center and Karen Kastler joins from the State House. If you missed any portion of the program, find us online or listen to the Sound of Ideas podcast. You can also hear a rebroadcast tonight at 9 on 89.7 WKSU. Now, we are off Monday for the President's Day holiday. And on Tuesday, we bring you another installment of our quarterly special, Talking Foreign Policy. On this episode, you'll hear a discussion of what's next in the war between Russia and Ukraine as the conflict is about to enter its third year. I'm Jenny Hamill. Thanks so much for listening, and I will speak with you again on Tuesday.